I see things that others do not. A different world. A world that's changed enormously just in my lifetime. 60 years ago, when I began exploring the ocean, no one imagined that we could do anything to harm it. The ocean is dying. It's a pleasure to introduce a scientist, an engineer, a teacher, and an explorer. She spent more than 7,000 hours of her life underwater, working to study and save our planet's oceans. And in 1998, she was named Time Magazine's first ever hero for the planet. The Oakland resident is a National Geographic explorer in residence and was the former chief scientist for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. A world expert in aquatic plants and marine ecology, Sylvia Earle has led hundreds of ocean expeditions and published more than 150 papers and articles, along with several prominent books on marine science and technology. Since the 1950s, she's been a pioneer of undersea research and exploration, fearlessly pushing the boundaries of what humans can do in the deep blue. I have an older brother and a younger brother, and I was one of the boys, if you will, <laughs> tomboy, if you will. My backyard was the Gulf of Mexico. That's where I first fell in love with the ocean. I think if others had the opportunity to witness what I have seen in my lifetime from thousands of hours underwater, I would not seem like a radical at all. I was really fortunate to have a chance to use some of the first scuba systems that were made available in the United States. First time I jumped into the water with a tank on my back, I wasn't really convinced that you could do it. You could breathe underwater. But when I put my face down and I actually could do it, it was such a gift, it was such a, a lift. It's still a joy every time I jump in. But as liberating as scuba was for her, eventually the limitations of the gear left her yearning for more. Early in her career, she decided if she was ever going to comprehensively study marine organisms in their environments, she'd need to stay underwater for longer than scuba technology would allow. The most ambitious project yet in ocean research has just started here in the sheltered bay of a beautiful West Indian island. Called Tektite II, it's the underwater base for a research project being run by a group of American universities with United States government backing. When I was at Harvard in 1969, I saw a notice on the bulletin board. How would you like, as a scientist, to spend two weeks living underwater down in the Virgin Islands? That was the pitch. <laughs> I'd already been diving a lot more than a thousand hours and published a number of things and it didn't occur to me that women need not apply. Well, my mother did say when I was a teenager that I could look forward to a career perhaps as a teacher, as a nurse, something really exciting. I could be an airline stewardess, <laughs> not a pilot, not a doctor, you know, not a superintendent of schools. It was just the way things were. Why shouldn't I be able to use capabilities that I have to do what my brothers could do or what Cousteau did? Along the way, I found that many people did think it was not just unusual, but preposterous. <laughs> and Jim Miller, the head of the program who had to finally make the call, said, well, half the fish are female, half the dolphins, half the whales. I guess we can put up with a few women. Now, a team of divers will attempt to live for two weeks as quiet residents on the sea floor. Ironically, these aquanauts are not men with extraordinary physical endurance and stamina, but five young and attractive women, the world's first real-life mermaids. Their leader is a renowned scientist, Dr. Sylvia Earle. 
a marine botanist and an experienced diver. We had four-hour dives. That's not possible in a single tank of air. But since we didn't have to go up, all the decompression took place at the end. We could stay down indefinitely. We spent 12 hours a day and night. We could go in and out, sleep, eat, write up our notes, look through microscopes in the warm, dry inside of our underwater house. It was just terrific. Diving with the Tektite project. Headlines all over the world. It caught the imagination of people. Five women living together underwater. I mean, it was such a concept back in 1970. The next big <laughs> headline, I suppose, was a few years later, 1979, when I was working on a project with the National Geographic, and I discovered that there was this diving suit called Jim, J-I-M, operated by Oceaneering International, mostly for commercial uses in the offshore oil and gas industry. And one thing led to another, and it finally turned out that, okay, I would get to try that suit as a scientist to evaluate it for scientific purposes. The Jim was a metal diving suit that maintained a normal atmospheric pressure inside, allowing divers to go to depths of 1,500 feet, 10 times deeper than with traditional scuba gear. Earl's 1979 Jim suit dive set a record for the deepest dive ever made without a cable to the surface. And the experience would forever change the course of her career. I got down to 400 meters, 1,250 feet. There were bamboo coral. These are unbranched, single whisker-like corals that grow in a spiral, six feet tall or more. I reached out and touched one, and rings of blue luminescence, blue fire, pulsed. If I touched it here, the pulses would go up. If I touched it here, the pulses would go down. If you, you touch two places simultaneously, you got these rippling rings of blue fire going up and down. It was such a joy to do this. I mean, I, uh, well, I get a, I still get chills just thinking about what, what a breakthrough it was for me. And that's really what got me started, wanting to develop submarines that I could drive. So I began discussions right there on the spot using the gym with one of the engineers involved, Graham Hawks. From their experience with the gym suit, Earl and Graham Hawks went on to develop a mini submarine called Deep Rover. It was everything the gym suit wasn't, nimble, fast, and easy to manipulate. In Deep Rover, she set yet another depth record in 1985, the first solo dive at 3,300 feet. It's a leap beyond scuba. Here we are at 1,300 feet looking at Spanish dancers in action. And I do dream of the day that lots of little micro submersibles will be out there. People should be able to have access to the sea so they can understand it, take care of it. Astronauts and aquanauts alike really appreciate the importance of air, food, water, temperature, all the things you need to stay alive in space or under the sea. I heard astronaut Joe Allen explain how he had to learn everything he could about his life support system and then do everything he could to take care of his life support system. And then he pointed to this and he said, life support system, <laughs> we need to learn everything we can about it and do everything we can to take care of it. The poet Auden said, thousands have lived without love, none without water. 97% of Earth's water is ocean, no blue, no green. If you think the ocean isn't important, imagine Earth without it. Mars comes to mind, no ocean, no life support system. In my lifetime, since I was a child, more change has happened in the sea than during all preceding human history. It sounds like a big, bold statement, but it is true. We've lost on the order of half of the coral reefs. We've seen an explosion of dead zones in coastal areas around the world. You can boil it down to simple things like what we're putting into the ocean, carbon dioxide, excess carbon dioxide, that is not only a problem for warming the atmosphere and driving the temperature up, but also driving the acidification of the ocean toward new levels. The other category of problems, though, comes from what we're taking out of the ocean. In the past 50 years, we've seen the loss of 90%
of the big fish in the sea because we've taken them. They, they aren't lost. We know where they've gone. We've eaten them. And the most important thing that we take out of the ocean is our existence. It's not oil, gas, fish, crabs, oysters, or anything else, or even the fun that we enjoy. It's, we need to protect the ocean as if our lives depend on it, because they do. When I came to the Caribbean as part of the Tektite mission in 1970, the reefs here were full of life. Today, those reefs are gone. It's happening all over the world. About half the corals are gone globally from where they were just a few decades ago. The ocean is dying. Natural systems on the land are in big trouble too, but the problems are more obvious. And some actions are being taken to protect trees, watersheds, and wildlife. And in 1872, with Yellowstone National Park, the United States began establishing a system of parks that some say was the best idea America ever had. About 12% of the land around the world is now protected, safeguarding biodiversity, providing a carbon sink, generating oxygen, protecting watersheds. And in 1972, this nation began to establish a counterpart in the sea, national marine sanctuaries. It's another great idea. The good news is, that there are now more than 4,000 places in the sea around the world that have some kind of protection, and you can find them on Google Earth. The bad news is that you have to look hard to find them. In the last three years, for example, the U.S. protected 340,000 square miles of ocean as national monuments, but it only increased from 0.6 of 1% to 0.8 of 1% of the ocean protected globally. Protected areas do rebound, but it takes a long time to restore 50-year-old rockfish or monkfish, sharks or sea bass or 200-year-old orange roughy. We don't consume 200-year-old cows or chickens. Protected areas provide hope that the creatures of Ed Wilson's dream of an encyclopedia of life or the census of marine life will live not just as a list, a photograph, or a paragraph. Our ignorance is really the biggest problem that we now face. We now can learn from the past and as never before, do something about it before it's too late. Sylvia has a wish for the planet, what she calls her mission blue. And it's really very simple. Protect the ocean in the same way we now protect the land. I wish you would use all means at your disposal. Films, expeditions, the web, new submarines, a campaign to ignite public support for a global network of marine protected areas, hope spots, large enough to save and restore the ocean, the blue heart of the planet. How much? Some say 10%, some say 30%. You decide how much of your heart do you want to protect. Whatever it is, a fraction of 1% is not enough. My wish is a big wish, but if we can make it happen, it can truly change the world and help ensure the survival of what actually is, as it turns out, my favorite species. That would be us. For the children of today, for tomorrow's child, as never again, now is the time. Thank you. Thank you.